All right, good morning, 11 o'clock service. Good to be in the house of the Lord with you. Uh, and, you know, this is uh, it's just a building, but what, what makes it a church is that God's people are here. Uh, and so that's a really beautiful thing. Let me just start us with a word from the scriptures. Hebrews chapter 12, uh, one of my favorite uh, chapters in all of the book of Hebrews. The author says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, that, that is the saints that have gone before us, Let us also lay aside, just like them, every weight and sin which clings so closely. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. We have come this morning to consider Jesus, who is our forerunner, who goes before us, and he counted it joy, running into uh, the, the shame of the cross, right? Taking on, bearing our sin, he counted that joy and led the way for us to count it all joy when we face trials of various kinds. For the testing of our faith produces steadfastness, right? And so we get this morning to look to Jesus, to worship Jesus, the risen Savior, who is our victor. Would you stand uh, and let's rejoice in the Savior who has had victory over death. Oh, 
proclaim your triumph in the cross. You're my Savior, my defense. No more fear in life or death. Well, I know how the score. everything that you have, church. this morning. Would you respond to Ephesians chapter 1 with me? Let's read the scriptures. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Next slide. (laughs) Even as he chose us. We're really testing you guys this morning. (laughs) It's good. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. To the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. This is the word of the Lord, church. Thanks be to God. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. All right, well, good morning. Welcome. It is good to be together. Good to be uh, have a chance to, to worship the Lord together. If you don't know me, my name is Ryan. I'm one of the pastors here, and, and uh, boy, I'm thankful to be here. Uh, just just uh, conversing with people both 9 o'clock and, and 11 o'clock just was reminded uh, in a new way. We're, uh, collectively, we're walking in with a lot of challenges. Uh, some of them are, are, are small, not, not huge, but but some hard things. Some of them are, are monumental, really hard stuff. Uh, and it is good to be in, in those, whether, whether it's small or big, our, our victory is found in Christ. And so it is good to be together, to worship the Lord together, to be reminded of, of who he is and what he's done on our behalf so we can uh, walk in that victory this week. Uh, a couple announcements uh, as we get started. Uh, we mentioned last weekend as well, but baptism. Uh, we have a baptism opportunity uh, April 27 and 28. Uh, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ and you have not been baptized, we would encourage you to do that. 
Uh, this is a great opportunity to do that. Uh, some people ask, so how does it happen here? What, what does a baptism look like? Um, we set up a tank right here on the floor, uh, and after we have a normal worship service, after the sermon, uh, we'll invite everyone who's being baptized in that service, and we have baptisms in all three services, Saturday night, uh, 9 o'clock, and 11 o'clock. Uh, invite you up, uh, you get a chance to, to give a brief testimony. And I, I hesitate to say that because that makes people really freak out sometimes. Uh, I have to be in front of a congregation with a microphone. We'll keep it simple. So if, some people are really comfortable, and you'll you say maybe you give a testimony that's several paragraphs long. Others will, will give a testimony that's a couple sentences. Others will say, I'm willing to answer a question or two. All right, we will work with you, whatever, whatever works for you. But the point is uh, to testify that you're a believer and then to be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so, like I said, if you're a believer and you've not done that, uh, this upcoming opportunity is a great chance to do that. I encourage you to grab these green cards, uh, put your name on it, circle B for baptism, and we will get in, co in contact with you and get you signed up for that. Uh, also, one of the things I've been sharing uh, periodically uh, just I call it ministry on ramps, ways to invest your life in serving the Lord. Uh, there's lots of ways to do it, and, and we are gifted in diverse and unique ways. And one of the ways I want to highlight uh, this weekend is the security team. Uh, we have a security team, that both a Saturday night team and then a Sunday morning uh, team. And I want to share, so what does this security team do? Well, first I want to st start with what they aren't. Uh, the security team are not church bouncers. Uh, they, they, they're not, there's not a bunch of tough guys who are looking for a problem. Uh, is, and, and absolutely, we are not trying to keep people out. No way. We want people to be welcomed in. So, so what are they doing? Well, they're being watchful and aware. Uh, just as we're all coming in and we're connecting with one another and finding our seed and, and getting ready to worship the Lord, it is nice to know there are a few people who are just keeping an eye on things so that we don't all have to be doing that. Um, they're, they're welcoming, caring, and compassionate, uh, ready to keep a level head uh, rather than being uh, just uh, drawn into a, a challenging situation uh, in an un, unhelpful way. Uh, they're looking to de-escalate situations rather than to escalate them, uh, but they're willing uh, when necessary to, to step into a situation where there's a, a bit of a challenge. Um, we, we live on a busy road, and we have lots of people come, and we are so grateful for that. And we are glad, glad for everyone who comes, whatever challenging situation they may be, may, be, may be arriving with. But occasionally, there are situations that need someone who's willing to say, hey, can we talk? And, and just to help uh, someone who, who's arrived uh, be comfortable and, and, and have a conversation and make sure that it, it, everything's okay. Um, and we just are aware that, yeah, uh, there are there are people in our world that don't like what we're doing on a Sunday morning. And so it's also helpful to people have people just keep an eye out for, okay, well, could there be a, a situation that arises that's more problematic? You understand what I'm saying. And, um, and so that's what the security team does. They're, they're ready to help in those situations. They're alert to needs as well. Uh, and so for our security team, of course, we run a, a comprehensive background check on our team members. We train our team members, both by putting them on, on a team with others who are uh, trained, so they are getting trained on the job. And then we do, uh, periodically, we do a team training for our security team. A couple months ago, I got to be a part of one of those, those uh, security team trainings, because I'm kind of security team adjacent. Uh, and, uh, and so I got to be there, for, uh, from, work from 9 to 12, talking and, and thinking together about how do we, how do we help our, our, our church family to be uh, safe and secure when they're here on a Sunday morning or a Saturday night. And I just say I was so encouraged by that meeting. Uh, it was not a bunch of people trying to be tough guys. It was not. It was people trying to figure out how, how do we care well for our, our congregation and serve well in this role. Uh, and so... Um, it was a group of, of men and women, and I say that, it's important. Men and women are, are invited to be a part of the security team because there are needs sometimes to engage uh, men and women, and it is helpful to have both on our security team. Um, but with compassionate hearts that, that care about the congregation and care about keeping us safe as best as possible while we're here. Isn't that good? That is good. And so if you're interested in, in getting in more information about the security team, you're not promising you're going to do it, but you say, okay, tell me more information. Uh, again, grab these green cards, put your name on it, indicate on the back that you're interested in more information about the security team, and I will be in touch. So now I'm going to have Pastor Toby coming up. He's going to be sharing about phase two.
If any of you happened to look that direction as you were coming in, you saw a big pile of rubble, uh, what used to be a house. Uh, why is that? Well, it has to do with paving the way for something called phase two. Uh, those of you who've been around for a little while know lots about that because it, we were talking a lot about it uh, over the last couple of years, but there's been kind of radio silence for the last six months or so. Uh, in fact, there's not even a model in the uh, foyer, or there wasn't. Uh, we put it away for Christmas and just now got it back out because now there's something to say. So I wanted to kind of get uh, those of you that are aware of it up to speed on what's going on. And we also want to also, um, for those of you that might be newer, what is phase two? It has nothing to do with the Marvel, Marvel movies, um, if you're wondering. So uh, you need to know that as a church, there has been a group of believers here uh, for about 75 years on this corner trying to make disciples of Jesus Christ. Uh, for the first 50 50 years of our, of our uh, life as a church, we used uh, an old school building that used to be parked right out there in the corner of the, uh, inter uh, of the parking lot, close to the intersection. Uh, we used it heavily. It was all used up when it finally had to get uh, crunched up like the house next door and thrown in a dumpster. Uh, the last 25 years, uh, we have had a lot of change in our city and in our church, which included building this current facility that we're in, which was phase one. Uh, that was in 2008. Well, God willing, our desire is to continue to have this be kind of a center for believers at Evergreen Bible Church to come make disciples until Jesus comes. Now, we all, I acknowledge that could be tomorrow, in which case it'll save us a lot of work. Uh, <laughs> but we also want to be ready in case it's not for another century or more, and, and I believe that's possible. So, therefore, that's why we're pursuing to build, to complete, I should say, a facility that will allow us to keep making disciples in this area for the next 100 years. The status on the project, very simply, is the demo is nearly complete. That paves the way for it. We'll finish it up this week. Uh, the building plans are all submitted to the city, and we're waiting for their, for their reply. Uh, we turned them in later than we hoped to, but that's just how projects go. Uh, so we are trying to wait patiently for that, and as soon as they give us the green light, we will begin uh, building it. Uh, it's expected to take about a year to build. Um, so why are we doing phase two? Uh, it is not to make our church bigger numerically. It does not increase our seating capacity. Uh, so why then are we doing it? It is to make us more effective in what we're doing. There are lots of ministries that are just waiting. If we had space, we could do it. But every night of the week is something's going on here, sometimes multiple things. Uh, during the day, almost every day, there are multiple things going on during the day. This facility is getting heavily used. Ministry ideas await space. Phase two creates that space. A couple of key features of the space, starting with the, uh, the commons, which is what we hope to call the big multi-purpose room. Right now, anything that takes about more than 50 people has to happen in here because it's our only big room. So the commons will be another big room down the hallway, uh, and it will become home base for Awana, uh, for youth group, for uh, banquets and events, so many things that we do here. It also will have, as you see to the, to the left side there, uh, a kitchen, uh, which is about twice as large as this current kitchen that we have uh, that will serve events that are going on in there. By the way, that kitchen will turn into pastoral offices so that all of our pastors can have an office. We think that would be helpful. Um, we will also have a, uh, a centralized children's ministry area. Uh, downstairs, there will be nurseries where they currently are. Upstairs will be the new children's ministry area where all the rooms are really close together, easier to check in and monitor and keep things safe. And an added advantage, not right above the back of the sanctuary where you hear the thunder roll. Uh, that's just, you know, it's not bad, but it's just I think it's, it'll be better. Uh, there will be more classrooms for all kinds of events and activities as well. And then last but not least, some much-needed relief for our parking lot, uh, which is often full, and there's only one way in and out. So it does add some more parking spaces, but most significantly adds another way to get in and out of the parking lot that empties out onto 95th Avenue there. So that's all of the, so some of the keynotes of why uh, we are building Phase 2 and why we think it will really help us make disciples. So I'm going to ask Evan Chalker, our treasurer, to come explain how we're going to pay for this. Yeah. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, 
so yeah, I'll walk through kind of what our original plan was to pay for phase two and kind of where we're at um, as far as progress towards that, that plan. Um, and, then, and then share how fundraising is going specifically and some information there of exciting news to share there and, and uh, give an update on um, kind of the budget and, and maybe financing and, and some next steps. Um, so as Pastor Toby just showed, I think it's so good for our collective memory to see those pictures from the past and, and see that we're inheriting an incredible blessing in this local church. Um, you know, it's right to think that the church is, is not uh, just uh, the building, right? It's, it's a body of believers. And in the same way that our local church is not the church, that the church is, is the, the church that Christ is building around the world. Um, but this particular local church is a blessing, and, and this particular local church, along with many, many others, has, has cared about the physical space where they meet. Um, and, and I think that's a fitting thing, that, that the place that we can meet and gather uh, to do ministry together, to worship the Lord, that, that we invest in that. That's what our church has always done, and, and we're taking part in that continuation of that um, as well as we make more and better disciples uh, for Jesus Christ, you know, and, and for the sake of, of reaching all peoples around, around uh, the whole world. Um, so this, this first slide is our original kind of plan to, to pay for phase two at a very simple level, um, at the highest level. So uh, just the, the total cost we estimated uh, at the beginning was $4 million uh, for the project. Um, we anticipated having around $1.6 million in cash um, just on hand, apart from fundraising, uh, at the time when we would need to 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 be done, to be have a, to have a loan, um, we we targeted raising 1.2 million dollars. This was our again our original plan, and and then at the, at that point we would think the the, the remaining uh, 1.2 million dollars would be a loan. Um, so how does that compare with where we're actually at as of uh, the end of this month or as of today? Um, so we can see here that we have um, significantly more uh, cash on hand, looking on, the, on that chart on the right there, than we anticipated. So why is that? Well, despite um, doing fundraising for phase two, we have seen actually our regular giving be higher than our target. So we've, we've received more giving, even, even in regular giving, than we, than we targeted. Um, and then we, as a congregation decided at the end of this last year to transfer money from other funds into our building fund. So that's another reason for, for that increase there. Um, a big part of that, I'll just mention here, the, the plan to have $1.6 million came from um, an estate from George and Hazel Stein. $700,000 of that money was from that estate. So that has been received, and, and that's, that's part of that as well. Um, okay, so then the, the really amazing news to share is that we've raised $935,000 uh, to date. Yeah. So, yeah, so just an incredible testimony to the Lord's faithfulness, and we'll, um, we'll give more information on that in a second. Um, just that last thing was $800,000. Even if we had to get a loan today, our loan would be smaller uh, than, than what, we, what we planned for, so really good news. Um, so a little more information on, on this, the, the $935,000 in giving. Um, we're three-quarters of the way through our two-year fundraising period, and we're, we're just over three-quarters of that $1.2 um, we've seen 158 individuals and families participate financially in, in giving to phase two. Um, so it's been, it's been a, an amazing collective uh, effort. Um, there have been some large gifts. You saw this particularly kind of early on, some one-time gifts that were really significant. And, and, the, and we're amazed by those as well. Um, uh, just the Lord's provision to provide those funds and, and the generosity of, of people as well. Um, so uh, one other bit of information on giving, just that it's encouraging, is that we, we gathered pledges uh, back in, in um, October, September of, of 2022. We've received to date 92% of what we would have expected to, to be given from those pledges so far. So that's just amazing. That's a really high number. Um, yeah, praise the Lord again. Yeah, we we'll clap for that too. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's one thing to, to plan it, and that was good to plan and, and even sign your name to it, to, but to, for the Lord to provide those funds to be able to give is really cool to see. Um, just a, a word on our philosophy on fundraising. Um, we believe that it should be infrequent, that we should be asking for giving over and above kind of regular regular giving, um, and that you should never feel any pressure or, or compulsion from, from your leaders uh, to give. Um, God calls us all to give to our local church regularly, and we want to teach clearly about that when the time is appropriate. We don't want to shy away from the Bible's teaching about money or giving, 
Um, but as, as leaders, we want to be responsible and not, not push um, any, any sort of compulsion on anyone. So we want to be joyful, free, humble as well, and, and, and generous givers. Um, and thankfully, our church has, has continued to, to really be that. We see that again and again. Um, so all this giving has brought our, our building fund balance, you can see there, to a, a whopping $3.2 million. So a lot of money. Um, so what are, we, what are we doing with that? Um, well, um, so most of it uh, is in certificates of deposits, so getting, getting about 5% annual interest on it. Um, so that, that helps to, to pay for, for the expenses that are coming. And then we've also had $118,000 just in expenses since the start of the project related to site planning, for the permits, applying for those, and, and inspections, various items. Um, so it's already being used. And um, because of this, our goal is now to get to the end of the construction phase, which would be in about a year where we would aim to be done with construction and have no loan. So that's the, the new goal. Um, and we think this is a, a realistic goal, but it, it is remarkable to even think that that's close. Um, and, and so that's, it's due to, to the tremendous giving uh, that we've seen. And, and like everything else, we want to continue to rely on the Lord um, and trust him to provide. And, and also to so that we're not, um, you know, the Lord could provide it even if we are self-sufficient. He could still provide it. Uh, but we want to be able to, to glorify him by, by giving him the, the credit and not ourselves, right? So... So that's another reason to continue to rely on the Lord. Um, a, a key, one last final word, is a key element of our, our church constitution and really the way that we just, we like to do things is, um, is that we make decisions, particularly big decisions, together as, as a church family. And, and we know that um, right now, we, as I mentioned, uh, I think I said this, we don't really have, we have that, just that $4 million estimated budget at the start. We're probably about a month or two away from having an actual budget um, from our contractor. And so once we do have that information, that will, of course, be really important uh, information. And we want to share that with all of you as far as what, what that looks like, that number. Um, and so we'll be communicating that. And if there's any big surprises or changes, we'll, we'll be meeting again to make decisions on that. Um, but look for, in the meantime, updates in the Evergreen Connection, as well as uh, in, in the announcement slides uh, going forward weekly. We'll have a, a progress update if there's any, any update on the project, and then a fundraising update as well um, there. So um, now Toby's going to talk about uh, some responses. Yeah, and, and the first one is just tagging on to what Evan uh, just shared in terms of the fundraising. It's so in honestly humbling and amazing to see what God has been doing. Uh, I am, as I mentioned, that you can participate financially. Primarily what I'm saying is so many of you already have. I'm not trying to say, can you do a little bit more? Uh, what I'm prim primarily saying is thank you and praise God for what he's doing here. For those of you that might say, I missed out at the beginning and I'd like to be part of that, we printed a few of these uh, giving packets. They just show, here's, they explain what it looks like to be involved. And those are back there in the foyer uh, by the little model of the project. And you can pick one of those up if you'd like. Uh, some of you would be interested in helping just tangibly, hands-on. What can I, is there volunteer uh, information? And the answer is yes. Uh, so I would just encourage you, you could use this green card. Mention I'm interested in joining either the maintenance team, you could just write that on the back, or the grounds team. Both of those teams, which I lead, will be kind of frontline workers for all volunteer projects uh, that have to do with phase two. So you could just write your name on there and say, uh, add me to one of those teams and we'll keep you in communication. Uh, and then lastly, uh, we want to continue to pray. And, and I, I know that that's the Christian thing to say, but I want to recall that when we were working on phase one, we were desperate. It was not hard to become desperate because the project was so much bigger than what we could envision. How is this going to work? The, 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 the logical uh, probability of success was medium to low. That was the official assessment. Uh, and yet God did it. This time around, the, the situation is way different. This is much more doable from a human perspective, and that makes me nervous. When, when you feel like you, you got this and don't need the Lord, you're in a dangerous spot. I don't want to be in that spot. And so I would encourage you, there's these little postcards, again, out by the model that it say, says praying for phase two. And there's a lot of scriptural ways of praying about these things listed on the back. I would encourage you to take one of those. And now that things are starting to happen, 
Let's renew our prayers for these things and ask God to help us be dependent upon him when it's actually harder to because the situation has changed. So let me lead us in prayer now, if I may. Father, you've heard my testimony. You know my anxiety about <laughs> operating from, at least humanly speaking, a position of strength this time around. And Lord, all we can do is commit it to you and say, the situation is different, but you're not different. And our need is not different. Lord, a person who is, is physically healthy is just as desperate for your hand as the person who is in ICU. You hold them both in your hand. And apart from your will, neither one will continue to live. And so, Lord, we are truly desperate for you. I pray that you help us to know that and pray that way. And that we would not just build a building, Lord, you would build our faith. You would build our maturity in Christ. And we ask these things in Jesus' good name. All God's people said, amen. amen. Okay, that was a lot of announcements this morning. So kids, you get a star on your chart just for enduring. Uh, and you can go upstairs to Children's Church. Everybody else stand up and be a blessing to someone nearby. All right, if you would find your seats and stand with us if you're able. Let's continue to worship in song this morning. Come and stand before your maker, full of wonder, full of fear. Come behold his power and glory, yet with confidence strong here. For the one who holds the heavens and commands the stars above is the God who to bless us with an unrelenting love. Rejoice, come and lift your hands and raise your voice. He is worthy of all praise. Rejoice, sing the mercies of your King and with trembling rejoice. We are children. Always sacrificial blood, bringing reconciliation to a world that longs to know the affections of a father who will never let them go. Rejoice, come and lift your hands and raise your voice. He is worthy of all praise. of your King, and with trembling rejoice. All our sickness, all our sorrows, Jesus carried up the hill. He has walked this path before us, He is walking with us still. Turning tragedy to triumph, turning agony to praise, there is blessing in the battle, so take heart and stand amazed. Rejoice when you cry to Him, He hears your voice. He will wipe away your tears. Rejoice in the midst of suffering.
see the mercies of our King as we open the scriptures. Go ahead and have a seat, church. Yeah, amen. Grateful for the opportunity to continue our worship as uh, we turn to God's word and uh, the truth that he has to share with us this morning. Um, since Ryan had so diligently actually last week uh, advertised I was going to be preaching the Beatitudes. If you were here last week, you probably heard that. I was joking with someone uh, yesterday morning after a, an event here at church. How we'll, we'll get to see who the, the faithful, committed attenders and members of our church are who are showing up despite knowing that I'm preaching. So you guys made it. Congrats. <laughs> grateful to have you. Uh, even more grateful to be able to jump into the Sermon on the Mount with the Beatitudes this morning. Toby and I actually switched spots this week, which was uh, a first for us, at least since I've jumped on staff. Um, he, the, the youth group this week, Wednesday night, was blessed to uh, be able to hear from a veteran youth pastor, um, open the word for them. And then you guys get to be blessed this morning hearing from a youth pastor because it means you guys will get to be young uh, this morning, which, um, yeah, would be probably more exciting for some of you than others. But uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, Super grateful to be able to jump in with you guys to the Sermon on the Mount. Fun fact is we refer to it as the Beatitudes. If you're anything like me and have grown up in the church and heard that term and been confused, like, why do we call it the Beatitudes? Uh, it did not come from some English monk who was thinking, yes, this is the way your attitude ought to be or ought to be blessed, um, even though it kind of might sound that way. Uh, it actually comes from the, the Latin title for it. It comes from the Latin word for blessed, which if I'm pronouncing it correctly, it's beatus. So... If you're wondering why do we call it the Beatitudes, now you know. Well, so you know a little bit more. So, uh, I want to begin our time this morning um, by starting posing you guys with a question. I challenge you to consider for a moment. When you think of the good life, what do you think of? What comes to mind? When you think of the good life, what do you think of? What goals, dreams, aspirations, ways you spend your time or ways you don't spend your time? Like, what do you do in pursuit of what you would consider the good life? I'm a little late to the party on this one, but this past week I finally got around to watching the documentary Free Solo. Um, how, you got, how many of you guys have seen Free Solo before? Just curious. Okay, a few people. Um, if you are afraid of heights, don't look at that photo for too long. Um, but basically, Free Solo tracks the uh, attempt that uh, this, a rock climber named Alex Honnold uh, did to be able to free solo, basically climb um, the El Capitan rock face, which is in Yosemite National Park. It stands, it goes like straight up, like 3,000 feet above the va valley floor. Absolutely insane. And uh, he attempted to free solo it. He uh, basically, if you don't know what free soloing is, you're climbing without any assistance, without a harness, without a rope, without anything. So um, it requires perfection. So if you see him on there, he's like probably halfway up maybe um, and is... Yeah, his life is on the line. Um, there were points uh, in the documentary where he, and to use his language, where he said that he could only get like half his thumb on certain grip holds where his, he's just hanging by um, in order to get up. Uh, and he's the only person that has ever successfully accomplished this. So it ends with him accomplishing it. But obviously, if you were on the documentary crew recording this, some of them were terrified even watching. But if you, were on, if you had a camera, you were on the documentary crew, you'd be asking the question, uh, what in the world is driving Alex Honnold to accomplish this? Like, what is motivating him? Because as soon as I would approach that, obviously I would give up, I, would, I wouldn't even try. You know, like, what is motivating him to accomplish this? And through a series of conversations and discussions, he revealed that um, basically he, he does free soloing because there's no other source in life that is able to give him the same kind of happiness or full, sense of fulfillment he has other than when he free solos. Um, he explained that uh, when he is free soloing, when he's up on the rock face and he's able to accomplish those things, that it is the closest sense to perfection he can get. Because you literally have to be perfect when you're doing things like that or else your, your life is over, right? And so it's the closest sense he can get to perfection, therefore he feels a sense of fulfillment. And once he accomplished this at the end of the documentary, obviously he's extremely happy, excited that he did it, but then it continues and you recognize like, oh, well... He's just kind of looking to the next thing. He's considering like, oh, what's the next big thing I can do, right? That's, I think, today the biggest thing that he's done so far. But um, yeah, I, I share that story because while most of us would say my pursuit of uh, the good life, the blessed life, isn't nearly as crazy as him, right? Everything, no matter how crazy or ordinary our actions are, everything we do in life, I would argue, is motivated or directed somehow by what we would consider the good life. 
what we would consider a life of blessing, right? That drives us. Um, if we consider the world that we live in, we could see how many people are in pursuit of the good life. Um, if you consider every religion in the world, every religion offers some sort of blessing, some sort of future hope of escape in some form from the pain and suffering of this world, and pro- it, 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 um, promises uh, some sort of connection with the divine, right? Um, if you think about the different nations or people groups that are at war with one another throughout the world, right? They're trying to suppress their enemy, um, or they're trying to gain power and control to, whether they would say it this way or not, to experience what they would consider probably the good life or the freed life. In our nation, uh, many people find a lot of um, value in political freedom, uh, religious liberty, uh, the things that our nation was founded to try to create, and people pursued the good life in that way. Um, the American dream is something that many generations of people in our society have pursued, this idea of having um, security and fulfillment and material possessions in your bank accounts and where you're at with that. I, and I would argue, while that's still present, many of the younger generations coming up are probably more focused, at least some, uh, instead of focusing on material possessions, on a prosperity and experience. Like, how can I have a richness in what I'm able to experience or accomplish in life? Individually, we pursue things like a uh, successful career, successful family life, a peaceful family life, um, uh, friendships, fulfillments in those that we're able to be close to. People pursue sex or romance, physical health or longevity in life. All of these, we could go on and name many things that we pursue that would be somehow contributed to the good life, a life of blessing. And I believe, um, or if anything in uh, our our experience, or even if anything that human history has shown us, is that none of these things are able to ultimately fulfill, All right? Everyone gets the end of life, and their, their health gives out, or they reach a point where they recognize, yeah, that was good, but it didn't really fully satisfy me in the way I thought. Even King Solomon, if you guys think of him, who was probably one of the most prosperous, um, wealthy, he had everything you could imagine uh, that a human could have, whether it's wealth, comfort, entertainment, control, power, um, women, uh, wisdom, all of these things that we value and hold dear. At the end of his life in Ecclesiastes, he says, it's just meaningless. Uh, it's vanity. It's like this, this vapor that appears, and as soon as you try to grasp it, it's gone. It vanishes, right? Um, and he, our, our human experience uh, points to that. And I believe all of these things point to the fact that we have been created to experience fulfillment. We've been created with this God-given need for what we might consider the good life, all right? We aren't just experiencing these desires randomly. Like, there's a reason for that. In our Torah series, so if you've been with us this past year working through the Torah, we've seen the theme of blessing pop up in a number of spots. Um, we don't have time to get into all of those, but I just wanted to highlight a few as we're preparing to jump into the Sermon on the Mount. Um, first, we saw when God created the universe, when God created all things, uh, and he, before he even, when he created humanity, before he even commissioned Adam and Eve and gave them instruction for how they ought to live, it says in Genesis 128, the first chapter of the Bible, and God blessed them, right? We see that God's original intent and design for humanity was that they would be able to experience blessing and a life that was flourishing um, in relationship, in and through relationship with him. Like that's, that's w- why we were created. That was God's heart for us. But then we see Adam and Eve fall into temptation where the serpent promised a false form of blessing, uh, where they would be able to come like God and it turned into a rebellion against God and ultimately resulted in death. After sin entered the world, um, God began with Abraham, making a covenant with Abraham, promising that through Abraham's descendants, through his line, that he would ultimately use his descendants to be a blessing to the world. Then we see after God made a covenant at Mount Sinai with the Mosaic covenant, giving the law to his people, Moses in Deuteronomy was giving the, the, um, another presentation of the law to the people. And at the very end of the Torah, we ended with a long list of blessings if God's people were to follow the Torah and curses if God's people were to be unfaithful and not follow after God's ways. The rest of the Old Testament makes it clear that uh, God's people were incapable of keeping his ways perfectly. They were unfaithful to God, following after other false forms of blessing in the world, 
And they, the, the Old Testament basically ends with God's people being sent into exile and trying to recover from this separation and brokenness state, that they, this broken state that they were in, um, this, this state of need. And you and I today are no better off than the people were in the Old Testament and as they were awaiting the need of their Savior. And then that's when Jesus shows up. Right, we, we see in the New Testament, Ryan did a really good job last week. If you weren't here last week, you should go back and listen. He basically gave, gave us this, this connection. He was connecting the dots for us between the Torah, between uh, Jesus' life as he's coming, um, or how Matthew is presenting him in his gospel account. Uh, Matthew is writing, um, just to kind of sum it up a little bit, Matthew is writing to a Jewish audience in, in his gospel account of Jesus. And so he's trying to connect a lot of those dots for, for the Jewish audience that would be coming from a place where they knew the Old Testament well. And so Matthew presents Jesus as, he, he makes it clear that Jesus came in the line of both Abraham and David. He was a descendant, okay? The promise, he was the promised, uh, it, within the promised line that the Messiah would come through, we saw that Jesus rewalked many of the steps of Israel and the steps of others that had come before him, but he did so without sin. Okay, Matthew makes it clear in uh, Matthew 2.15 that Jesus came out of Egypt, all right? Not long after, he, experienced, he went into the wilderness where he was tempted for 40 days, 40 days and nights, kind of mirroring, and I would, I would say, the, the 40 years that the Israelites um, were in the wilderness, um, but he did so without sinning. Can you guys imagine the Israelites not complaining in the wilderness? How incredible that would be. And yet Jesus uh, sh- did that in order to show, um, to, be, to show us that he is greater, that he was able to follow the Lord perfectly without falling into temptation. Um, we saw that Jesus entered the Jordan River, and instead of the, the Jordan River being parted like we see for the Israelites to enter the Promised Land, Jesus enter, enters into the Jordan River, and the heavens are parted, okay? It's a, it's a sign that Jesus is greater. Uh, we are told in Matthew 4.17 that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That Jesus is ushering in the kingdom of God that the nation of Israel is incapable of, of bringing, of, of ushering in. Um, and then finally, the start of the Sermon on the Mount in, Ma- in Matthew chapter 5, verse 1, we see that Jesus goes up onto a mountain to give the law to his people. So instead of uh, being like Moses, the greatest po- prophet in the Old Testament, Moses went up on the Mount Sinai to receive the law from God. Instead, we see that uh, Jesus goes up onto a mountain. Instead of receiving the law, he gives the law as the one who is Lord and authority over the law. Okay, so all of these things should be screaming to us, listen to Jesus, right? He is the promised Messiah, the promised hope that is to come, and we are in desperate need of knowing what he has to say because our life depends on it, all right? So church, would you join me in just doing just that, listening to the words of Jesus? If you're able, I invite you to stand. We're gonna begin... In chapter 5, verses 1 through 12, and we're going to see that Jesus' words that he starts with in his sermon, the first words that he gives in Matthew here, are about to challenge and completely turn upside down our framework of how we often see blessing in our world. Starting in uh, verse 1 of Matthew chapter 5. And seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain. And when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Let's pray. Lord, as we come before your word, today, Lord, and look at the, the teaching of Jesus, God, that we recognize, Lord, that your words are more important than mine. Your words are more important than anyone in this room, Lord, and uh, we need to listen to you. God, I can't help but picture the, the imagery on Mount Sinai, Lord, when Moses went up to receive 
received the law, God, and you met him with your power and glory, with fire and smoke, Lord, and how that put fear and, and a sense of reverence into the hearts of all who are looking at this, this moment, Lord. And um, Lord, as we look at the words of Jesus and how he went up on the mountain to give the law, Lord, I pray that we would not lose that, that, that hearts and attitude of reverence and fear, a proper fear of how um, powerful and amazing, Lord, you are. Um, help us to, to see your heart clearly in these words, Lord, and I pray that you, Lord, this would not just lead to um, an external change, Lord, but that you'd be transformed the hearts of our whole church. We ask this in your name. Amen. You may be seated. All right, so in many ways, the Beatitudes, I would say, uh, function as the introduction for the whole sermon. Okay, it's Jesus' first words. And since it's the introduction for the whole Sermon on the Mount, a lot of what we're going to be looking at um, this morning within the Beatitudes, within these verses, is going to set the tone and trajectory for the whole sermon, right? Jesus is basically explaining and setting setting the tone for where he's about to go for the whole sermon. Um, And as I've looked at, studied this passage um, throughout this, the past couple of weeks, I think that uh, there are two questions that the Beatitudes specifically, and in many ways, the whole sermon is trying to answer. Okay, so there's, there's two specific questions Jesus is trying to answer in these statements. The first one is, what is true discipleship? First question is, what is true discipleship? As we can see in verse 1, Jesus goes up onto a mountain And he is portrayed as not just a teacher, but as someone who is Lord over the law. And then he says that uh, he began, it says that he began to teach his disciples, right? So Jesus goes up onto this mountain. A lot of scholars, there's this mountain by the Sea of Galilee called Mount Beatitudes. Um, I'm assuming it wasn't uh, named it named that when Jesus went up, obviously. It's been named that since then. And so a lot of scholars think that this is likely the mountain where Jesus would have given the sermon or somewhere close to this. And uh, before, before his sermon, we see that there were crowds following him. And so as Jesus goes up on this mountain, while this mountain doesn't look like many of the mountains we have in the Northwest, uh, I'm sure if you were looking up this mountain, you'd consider, am I, am I wanting to walk all the way up this or not, right? So as Jesus went up on the mountain, I'm sure the crowds thinned a bit, even though there were many following him. And so he takes this opportunity as people are, are showing uh, a level of commitment to wanting to follow him to explain what it means to follow him, right? He's taking this opportunity as, as he's speaking to them to explain what does it mean to be a true disciple of Jesus. Um, and the rest of the sermon, I think, in many ways is attempting to answer this. What, what, does the, what is a true disciple of Jesus? What does his life look like? What does his or her life look like? look like? What does it mean to follow him? So that is the first question. What is, it, what is true discipleship? The second question I think that this sermon and the Beatitudes are trying to address is what is true human flourishing? What is true human flourishing? Uh, as is made really clear in the first 12 verses, we saw a word keep popping up, uh, specifically the word blessed. It's at the beginning of each of the lines. And so that word holds a lot of weight, a lot of meaning, right? We need to understand what that word means. Um, blessed is a good translation. I would say it's a good translation for the word, but it can also leave us with like, kind of wondering what exactly Jesus is meaning, because there are so many w- ways in our culture today that we use the word bless or blessed, right? Um, if you were to look up hashtag blessed on Instagram, you'd find a lot of things there that Jesus wasn't necessarily talking about uh, that people are trying, that people use today. We say things like bless you when someone sneezes. Uh, we talk about counting your blessings, or we tell others, you're a blessing to me. Uh, or we might sign off with blessings, or Lord bless. There's all these ways we could go on. There's so many different ways we use it. Uh, and a lot of the time, I don't entirely know what's being communicated, right? So I'm sure that there's some of you who feel similarly. Uh, so just a few mo- moments ago, we took some time to walk through some of the key points in the Torah where we saw God's intent for blessing. Um, but to take it a step further, we're going to look at the, the Greek word there for, that's translated blessed um, is makarios. And in our translation, at least in my translation, it's translated blessed. Some of you, your Bibles might say happy, you might use the word happy. If, you get, if any of you are following the Bible project with what they're working through right now with the Sermon on the Mount, they are choosing to translate that word as the good life, right? So we have some of those options. Uh, but to take a step further, makarios is the same Greek word that we see 
um, to translate in the Septuagint, so the Greek translation of the Old Testament, we see it translates the, to, to describe the blessed man that we see in Psalm 1. So I want to turn there with you guys to be able to get just an idea of what this kind of blessing looks like. And Psalm 1 describes the blessed man, and it says this. It says, But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and all that he does he prospers. All right, so we see in this psalm, that the type of blessing, the theme of blessing that Jesus is picking up on when he's talking in the Sermon on the Mount, Sermon on the Mount this, this type of blessing is a, a prosperity in life, okay? It's this true human flourishing where life is produced. We see that the blessed man is grounded and rooted in experiencing a true life and fruit in and through relationship with God and his law, his way of living. Okay, so I would argue that blessedness, the type of blessedness we're talking about, shouldn't be reduced to our modern uh, interpretation or understanding of happiness. Right? I think that uh, deals with it too lightly. This man that we see in Psalm 1 is flourishing, and Jesus picks up on this theme by describing the flourishing individual um, on the Sermon on the Mount. What does it mean to flourish? So we're going to take those two questions. Uh, what is true discipleship? What is true human flourishing? And we're going to basically bounce back and forth between those two as we handle each of the phrases on the Sermon on the Mount. So it's going to be a somewhat unconventional approach, um, but I think it will help us understand the, the, really the, what Jesus is trying to communicate in these verses. So let's start in verse 3 with Jesus' first statement where he says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We see in this verse, that true disciples of Jesus, uh, if I was to put it in my own words, are spiritually impoverished. True disciples of Jesus are spiritually impoverished. When you guys think of the neediest, most, uh, the, the poorest people in our society, um, we might think of those who are completely dependent on others for just their daily necessities, daily, daily food, da daily um, space to live, we might think of those who are, uh, have a medical condition that requires them to not be able to live alone or to be um, completely dependent on another just to stay alive, right? So a number of other pictures we could probably think of, but I, I believe that these are just a glimpse. Referring to the poor is just kind of a glimpse of the type of poverty of spirit that Jesus requires of his disciples. Um, being poor in spirit are those who are completely spiritually impoverished. They are the ones who are spiritually bankrupt. They're coming before the Lord recognizing that they have nothing to offer. Those who we could say are on spiritual life support. The type of poverty Jesus is referring to is not just those who are lacking in some areas of life, like, okay, Jesus, help me just improve in these areas, right? Coming before the Lord, being poor in spirit, is this attitude of confession recognizing our complete unworthiness and need for complete dependence on the Lord. That's the, kind of, of, um, un, that's the kind of being poor in spirit that Jesus is talking about. Okay, And if you're anything like me, I think in our culture like we can value self-sufficiency. Right? That's one of our, our values, at least um, mine over the years, of the, the idea of being able to be self-sufficient. So if you're anything like me and, and hold that value, the alarm should be going off in our head thinking, how in the world is this person flourishing? How in the world is this the type of person that Jesus says is blessed? Um, I think Charles Spurgeon uh, summarized it really well. He made a comment on this verse. He said, not what I have, but what I have not is the first point of contact between my soul and God. It's, it's those who... If we, if we pick it back up on the, the, the metaphor of someone being on spiritual life support, right, it would be foolish of them for someone that's on life support to, to brag that they don't need any medical intervention to stay alive, right? It would be right for them to recognize their weakness and recognize that they're dependent on another for their own survival. And I think that's just a glimpse in what the type of dependency that Jesus is calling us to. It is those who properly recognize the reality of their spiritual need for Jesus that experience flourishing because 
they are the ones that belong in God's kingdom. That's the answer. That's why they are living the life that is blessed. We see that true human flourishing is in God's kingdom. Okay, that is the place where true human flourishing, true blessedness is. It's because these people are the ones who belong in God's kingdom that they are truly uh, living the good life. The kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God um, basically are referring to the same thing. Matthew, like many good Jewish people of that time, uh, chose not to use the word God out of reverence and how holy they thought it was, so he substituted it for heaven. So when we're talking about the kingdom of heaven, we're, we're talking about the kingdom of God. It's referring to the same thing. And we could uh, define the kingdom of God as basically God's complete sovereignty and rule and authority over all things, right? If we think of the greatest empires or greatest earthly kingdoms that have ever existed, all of them have been over a certain uh, amounts of land or certain, have had control over a certain amount of people, and it's been for a limited amount of time. When we talk about God's kingdom, his kingdom and rule and authority is over all things, all of creation, and it's going to be for eternity, right? So when he talks about giving it to people, for instance, like when we think of a king desiring to give someone honor, right? We, there's examples where kings uh, in the past have, have granted people a request up until half their kingdom, right? We saw that an example of that in Esther and other places, um, so the fact that Jesus is choosing to not just offer half his kingdom, but his complete reign as an inheritance to those who are completely broken in spirit, uh, is communicating that God's, the God's greatest form of honor uh, to the lowliest of people, right? If you can't see grace in this verse, I don't know where else you'll see it. This idea of being of undeserved favor that we receive from the Lord is so incredible. Last observation I'll make on this verse uh, is that the kingdom of heaven, I think, is super important uh, in uh, the presentation in Matthew's gospel and with the Beatitudes because Jesus starts in verse 3 by giving the, the blessing of the, the kingdom of heaven, and then he ends in verse 10 with the last statement also saying that they receive the kingdom of heaven. So in many ways, it acts like bookends, right? It's, it's explaining that all of these blessings that Jesus is giving or explaining that his people will receive, his followers will receive, uh, fall in line with, with the kingdom of heaven. It's in the context of God's kingdom. All right, we need to keep moving. <laughs> Verse 4, uh, Jesus states, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And I'm going to say that true disciples of Jesus lament. We don't use that word a whole lot, lament, but lament is a passionate expression of grief or sorrow. It's this passionate expression of grief or sorrow. Followers of Jesus, I believe, are called to mourn and grieve their sin and the effects of sin in our world. We grieve our sin because it's a rebellion against God, a rebellion against his ways and the way that he's intended us to live to experience true life. It's our sin that's responsible for so, many, so much brokenness in our world, uh, destroyed families, destroyed relationships um, of wrong desires that are present in our own hearts. It's our, it's our sin that's responsible for nailing Jesus ultimately to a tree, the author and perfecter of life that he was killed um, because of our sin. We grieve the effects of sin. I was just thinking of all the memorial services um, and considering the effects of sin that we've had recently as a church. We had another one this weekend. And when you show up to a funeral, uh, remembering someone's life and encountering death in that kind of way, uh, it wouldn't be proper for us to show up um, without some form of grief, right? And I think that points to the fact that death is an effect of sin. It was never God's original intent for us to experience death. Like when we, when we encounter that, we sense like, oh, there's something wrong with this, right? It's not, God didn't create death just to be another cycle of life like some people believe it to be. Um, we've been experienced to experience life and never have to encounter death, and yet that unfortunately is as a result of our sin. And as God's people, we are able to grieve these things because God has given us the ability to interpret and see our world in a right way, which should lead to an attitude of lamenting. However, fortunately, it doesn't stop there. God's people, uh, the, the, those who lament, those who mourn, um, are blessed because true, we see that true human flourishing is comfort from God. True human flourishing is comfort from God. God desires... Uh, that we are comforted, 
That's his heart for us. It's not to leave us in a state where we are mourning the brokenness in our world. Um, in Isaiah, right after Isaiah basically explains what took place with um, the nation of Israel being sent into exile, being separated of God, from God because of their unfaithfulness, being taken away into captivity. Um, the first words in response to that in Isaiah 40, verse 1, it says, Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Jesus, we see Jesus is, or God's heart. And even in the, the deepest form, uh, the deep, deepest place of suffering, of sin, separation from him, that his heart was still to comfort his people. And as a result, we see that Jesus was his plan in comforting his people. For those of you who have experienced just really deep moments of distress and grief, you know that in those moments, um, often all that you're wanting to experience is just what you might consider true comfort, even if you can't explain what that is, right? This idea of experiencing true peace, shalom, uh, this rest to be understood, have someone be able to see the pain that you're going through. And God promises that those who lament are going to be truly blessed because of the comfort that they will receive from God. That's where true human flourishing is. Verse 5, Jesus continues with the statement, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. We see that true disciples of Jesus humbly put others first. I'm going to say they humbly put others first. Uh, I'll explain. The, the word meek has also been translated as gentle in some, uh, some Bibles. Um, meekness is definitely just not being nice. Uh, and as you may, some of you might have heard over the years, meekness is certainly not weakness, right? Um, for some help in understanding what Jesus is referring to here, I'm going to go to D.A. Car- take us to D.A. Carson's commentary. He defined meekness as a controlled desire to see the other's interests advance ahead of one's own. So if I was to put that in my own words, it is this type of humility that put others' interests first, right? It's this active form of humbling myself to seek the best for others, to seek to love others in the best way. Uh, human, I think this is really interesting because human history has shown us if anyone desires to have control over any land or people or power, uh, that typically has to be taken by force, right? And yet Jesus is saying, no, those who are going to inherit the earth are actually those that put others first, okay? We see that true, um, true human flourishing inherits the earth. What does this mean? If we were to look back uh, the covenant blessings that God made with Abraham and continued to repeat throughout the Old Testament, one of the, the th- themes that kept popping up is that God's people would in- inherit the promised land. They would inherit the land. Uh, when G- particularly a land that um, had borders in the land of Canaan in the Middle East that God was taking his people to to be able to be established. Uh, and when Jesus is making this statement, he's actually quoting a verse out of the Psalms. So Psalms 37 verse 11 says, but the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant peace. All right, so Jesus is quoting this verse, but instead of saying land, he's saying earth. Why is he saying that? Uh, When Jesus quotes this verse, I think he's recognizing that God's kingdom, when it is to be fully established, is not going to be limited in the boundaries that he had given his people in the land of Canaan, right? When God establishes his ultimate reign and sovereignty over all, uh, it's not going to have any boundaries. It's going to be over all things. So the people that are able to partake in his kingdom are going to be given the whole earth. God's sovereignty is going to be all, and his, his right rule is going to be over all things. Um, I think it's so cool how so many of Jesus' statements are connected to what we saw in the Torah or throughout the Old Testament, um, just pointing to the fact that he's the fulfillment of all these things. Um, all right, verse 6. Jesus says next, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. I'm going to say uh, true disciples of Jesus long for God's ways. They have a desire for God's ways. If you guys think about what it means to deeply hunger and thirst for something, that's just not like a, a temporary light desire, okay? When you are deeply experiencing hunger and our need of food or water, that is a desire that is going to continue to keep getting greater the more time that you are without something, right? So we could say that, um, that it is a longing for a necessity of survival, okay? It's, it's not just a submission of saying, okay, God, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll submit to the way you want me to live because uh, I have to, or that's what you require of me. 
Okay? Jesus is saying, actually, true disciples don't just submit. They have a passion for God's ways. They recognize that God has given us uh, instruction on how to live for our own good, and I want to be a part of that. Okay? Um, and we see that those who long for God's ways will ultimately be satisfied. True human flourishing is full satisfaction, as we see in the rest of the verse. It is full satisfaction. Jesus is meant to satisfy our deepest desires. We will be satisfied with true, when we desire Jesus, we will be satisfied with true righteousness by the one who came and lived a perfect life and the God who treat, treats us um, not in the way that we deserve, but in a way that is good. It reminds me, uh, again, if we go back to Psalm 37, the same psalm that we were just looking at, uh, verse 4 states, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. There's a promise that those who desire God, which is not something in our sin that we inherently always desire. But not that Jesus will please all of our desires, but that when our desires are rightly focused on him, he will never disappoint us. There's no disappointment. Jesus will satisfy us, and that is where we are able to truly flourish as humans. Verse 7 says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. We see that uh, true disciples of Jesus show mercy. I don't think there are a whole lot of other ways to put that. Um, we see that followers of Jesus follow in the ways of Jesus by showing compassion and forgiveness and not responding to people in a way that we would probably naturally desire when they hurt us. Um, I was just reflecting on, even, even as some, if you are someone here that thinks like, oh, I don't retaliate against those who I would consider my enemy. All right, I think that often we are guilty of easily falling into gossip or speaking poorly of people that we, that we dishonor, that we are angry of or that have hurt us, or even in the way that we choose to think of people. Forgiveness is hard, and yet we are called to show perfect mercy in the way that Jesus has shown us perfect mercy, in not treating us the way that we deserve to be treated. Um, and I also think that this phrase should not be taken legalistically, as if you are only going to receive mercy if you, from God if you've shown perfect mercy. All right? Obviously, none of us are capable of that. I think the second part of this statement assumes that we are in desperate, mer we are in need of mercy from God, right? We see that true human flourishing is given mercy. It receives mercy from God. It assumes that we are in need of God's mercy to actually live a blessed and flourishing life. And as we just reflect on the way in which God has done that through his son by sending his son to become the curse, to become, to take on our shame so that we could be blessed, um, that is true mercy. And that's the, the, the type of mercy that we're, we are called to follow, one that is patient and slow to anger. All right, we're over halfway. Got a few more. How are we doing? We good? All right. Verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Uh, we see that true disciples of Jesus are blameless at the core. They're blameless at the core. Being pure in heart implies that there is no impurity in someone, right? Coming out of the Torah series, the terms for pure or impure or clean and unclean, especially in the book of Leviticus, those should be super familiar to us, right? Or at least recognizable that these are, are um, common words that would have been used within the Torah. And we, we see in Leviticus that someone is incapable of approaching God's presence unless they are perfectly pure or unless they are perfectly clean, all right? No one is capable or able to approach the presence of God unless they are perfectly pure um, or unless they, are, they have a perfect substitute, a perfect substitute for them to be able to approach God. Um, the fact, I think, that Jesus implies that his followers will be able to see God, I think, points ahead to the perfect substitute that we'll have in Jesus, because we, all, we all have brokenness in our heart and sin. Um, and, they, and Jesus says that these are the people who are truly flourishing, because they are the ones who are able to see God. Okay, we see that true human flourishing beholds God in his fullness. It's able to fully uh, be able to behold God's glory, right? Do you all remember the story of when Moses went up on Mount Sinai in Exodus 33, um, where Moses went up and he asked God if he would be able to see him in his glory, and God responded to him. He says, you cannot see my face, for, no, for man shall not see me and live. Okay, so God ends up, is a result of trying to spare Moses' life because of his holiness. He ends up passing by Moses and shields him of his glory so that he would not perish before him. All right? So Jesus is making the statement here 
that true human flourishing, those who follow Jesus are going to be able to experience the true blessed life because their hearts will be transformed. Okay, this is speaking to heart change, being pure in heart. And because of the heart change that takes place in their heart, they will be able to fully see God for who he is. True human flourishing uh, means that there is no more separation from God. We no longer have to live where God is shielding, saying, okay, you can just come a little bit closer. I'll, I'll shield you from some of my glory. No, Jesus is saying that true human flourishing means that we'll be able to stand face to face before the Lord and see him in all of his glory. Next, in verse 9, we see, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Once again, Jesus moves beyond just addressing our heart condition, our need for heart, heart surgery, but shows us how it is supposed to translate outwardly. All right? there, there's action, evidence of the heart transformation we should see. And we see specifically that followers of Jesus are meant to strive to make peace, make peace in all of their relationships. Um, we're commanded to be a people that strive for the sense of shalom, this rest and peace that we have, um, that God has designed us to be able to live together um, with one another, to be able to experience in our relationships with one another. Uh, peace is an action, okay? It's something that we have to pursue. It's not just this passive thing that, okay, I guess I won't uh, be angry or have vengeance with this person, but it's something that we're meant to pursue. And Paul states in Romans 12, 18, he explains, if possible, so far as it depends on you, he said, live peaceably with all, all right? That's a, a command, something that is supposed to mark us as followers of Jesus. And we see that it is the peacemakers who are called sons of God. So true human flourishing, these people are flourishing because it is the peacemakers that I'm going to say are, are being an heir of God. They're the ones who are heirs of God. We see the, the topic of sonship is another theme um, that is really prominent throughout uh, all of Scripture. It's another one we could spend a lot of time on. But when Jesus refers to his followers as sons, he's not trying to discount all the women in his audience, right? Uh, we could also think of it as being sons and daughters of him. Um, but he, choose, I th he chooses to use that word intentionally, I think, because sonship holds a lot of weight for what it means in the Torah. Okay, when we think of a son or a firstborn son, that title is closely linked with an inheritance that you are, you are supposed to, that the, that the firstborn son would receive within that culture, in that family. So it's, it's closely linked with being an heir, someone that will receive an inheritance. Additionally, when we look at the Torah and we see um, the, the blessings that were given to sons, particularly firstborn sons, if we think about the blessing that Isaac gave to Jacob or the, the blessings that J Jacob would give to his sons, um, each of these blessings, when they were given, uh, it was permanent, okay? It couldn't be revoked. When Isaac blessed Jacob instead of Esau, it was permanent. It was, it was set in stone. So basically what Jesus is communicating, when he's calling us his sons, his sons and daughters, uh, he's saying that all of his followers, those who are his disciples, are adopted sons and daughters of the king of the universe, and his blessing that he has given to us, that is something that is permanent and will never be revoked, okay? It is this eternal security in Jesus that we are not, he's not just saying, um, I guess you can be a part of my family or I guess you can identify me. He's saying that we are complete heirs of his kingdom. And that is something that is permanent. Such good news. And he's saying that this is true human flourishing, to have this type of security um, in Christ. All right, made it to the last beatitude. Verses 10 through 12 uh, basically unpack the last statement Jesus makes where he says, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. We see that true disciples of Jesus will be persecuted. Okay, Jesus is making this a very clear statement. And this is the only statement that gets three verses to try to unpack, two lines, to try to, he's like, it's as if Jesus is hammering in the point, like, you want to follow me, you've made this commitment so far to follow me. Uh, he, it's as if he's hammering in the point and saying, if you choose to follow me, you better know the cost, right? Um, while I don't think we fully understand our culture or what it means to, to be persecuted in comparison to so many that have gone before us or others in our world today for the sake of following Jesus, um, regardless of what our persecution looks like, there is a huge cost to discipleship. There's a cost to following Jesus. If someone is running for an election, it's not usually suggested 
as they're trying to gain votes or followers, that they explain all the ways that people are going to give up things and lose stuff if they join their team, right? It's not a very good tactic to take. Uh, in this moment, Jesus isn't trying to just gain followers. He's not just trying to gain the approval of other. Otherwise, he would just be talking about the blessings. He wouldn't be talking about the cost it, it, it takes to be able to follow him. Um, and yet he is taking additional time to explain that if you choose to follow me, if you choose to follow Jesus, that means that you're, you have to completely turn from your old way of life. You have to completely submit to him and the, the type of life he is calling us to. And yet, Jesus communicates that following him, despite the suffering, the, the persecution, the, the loss you will experience, that it is the best decision you will ever make. We see that true human flourishing rejoices in identifying with Christ. True human flourishing rejoices in identifying with Christ. Why is it, church, why is it worth suffering for the sake of Christ? Why is it worth giving up so much? Okay, I think the answer is because we get to suffer for the sake of Christ. Like there, we, we are able to be identified with him. I think when we have a proper perspective of how great the Lord is, how great Jesus is, when we're in we fall short daily of truly being able to understand his greatness, right? We can, we can get a glimpse of it. But when we can truly understand how incredible he is, we should be willing to give up anything in this world for the sake of just being identified with him, right? That is something we do not deserve, and yet Jesus is saying following him is so worth it. As we begin uh, the Sermon on the Mount the next um, several weeks as we continue to work through this, um, I think the Beatitudes are really important for us to be able to grasp. Because not only are they um, suggesting the trajectory that Jesus is going or the topic that's being discussed within the sermon or the questions that he's answering, but I think it's also presenting for us a heart posture, the type of heart that we are to have when we come before the Lord and how we are, are to submit to his ways. This is the type of way that Jesus calls us to come before him and receive him. Jesus' first words here in the sermon make it abundantly clear that we cannot experience true human flourishing, the good life, without being a disciple of Jesus, All right? Or in other words, we could say as Jesus gives the law to his people, as he communicates the law to his followers, we cannot experience God's covenant blessings without being a part of his covenant people, All right? We saw that in the Old Testament. Jesus is making that abundantly clear in the New Testament as he comes. Many people, unfortunately, in our world, I think, pursue the blessings that God has to give without actually wanting to follow him or actually be identified with him. Just this past week, um, I heard of, there's, there's this interview where Richard Dawkins, I don't know if many of you guys are familiar with him, but he, Richard Dawkins is a very prominent atheist, and uh, he's basically devoted his life to like tearing down Christianity and other theistic, evol uh, theistic religions with um, atheism. He's the author of The God Delusion. He's been a professor at Oxford for many years. Anyway, this past, this past year or this past week, not past year, this past week, he um, basically explained in an interview that he would consider himself a cultural Christian, which I think is super ironic. Uh, he clarified by saying he definitely doesn't believe in God. It's not that he likes Christianity, but he appreciates you know, the, be the benefits of living in a Christian culture. He values the morals, values many of the benefits that he has of living in what he would consider a Christian culture. Um, that's an example of someone who is seeking the blessings uh, of God's instruction without actually submitting to him or wanting to do anything with Jesus. If you think about politics in our nation, right? There's people on all, regardless of political party spot you land on the spectrum, there's so many people that use scripture in our culture to try to back up how they, the, their, the way in which they live, um, the position they take on things, okay, they're trying to use God's word uh, to back up and be able to experience blessing in the way that uh, God has called us to live without actually having ev any evidence in their life of submitting to his ways. And there could be many of us here today that are seeking. We could be, you could come to church and be experiencing things or be pursuing and desiring things that are not of Jesus, right? Even if you come to church and with the desire to be a better person or improve your life or maybe even just grow in community with one another, Okay. Those things are good, but if that is the ultimate thing you're pursuing without first submitting fully to discipleship, to follow Jesus, uh, we're completely missing the point of God's instruction in the Sermon on the Mount. There are actually so many people that are not Christians that have come from other wor wor world religions that have looked at the Sermon on the Mount 
and thought it was absolutely incredible, the moral standard that Jesus and the way of life Jesus presented. And yet, if that's all that they're taking from it, if they are not choosing to be a part of God's covenant people, they are not going to be able to experience true human flourishing. We began this morning by looking at Psalm 1 um, to understand what the blessed life look like, looks like, but uh, that doesn't tell the full story, right? It's followed, believe it or not, by Psalm 2, um, where Jesus, or where Psalm 2 looks ahead to the promised Messiah, ultimately fulfilled in Jesus. It talks about the anointed one, the Messiah figure, the son, and the, the poem, the prophetic poem concludes by stating, blessed are all who take refuge in him. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. It's as if the, the, the person, the, the psalmist, the author recognized like, yes, God's, God's law was intended to give us life, but we are going to fall short of following that. Therefore, we need a perfect savior. And so it helps us connect the dots that uh, those who will, experiencing, will, will experience true blessing in life are actually those who find refuge in Christ, refuge in the blood of the lamb. Um, the theme of blessing is all through the Psalms. In many ways, Psalms 1 and 2 act as like the introduction to the whole Psalter. Uh, I could go on a tangent with that, but we see that theme uh, continue. One of, just one of those places, Psalm 32, says this. It says, blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Right? Why are our transgressions able to be covered, it's because we can find refuge in the promise of Jesus. And we are able to see that promise fulfilled. We aren't just stuck like the Old Testament, people, people in the Old Testament, just looking ahead to the fulfillment of this. We are able to see that, and that is such good news, church. As the worship team comes up, I just want to just mention, like, if there's only one thing you take away from this morning as we look at the Beatitudes, I want us to walk away recognizing that Jesus is the only way that leads to life. Okay. He came and he's portraying the, the life of blessing, the life of flourishing, not just to benefit us, but to be able to share God's heart. That this is the way he's intended us to live. Okay. God didn't give the law just to control us, but to help us be able to live a life of freedom and flourishing in him. That's God's heart. Jesus is the only one. And Jesus doesn't just point to life. He is the life. Okay. Life can only be found in him. Church, if, if you're here this morning uh, and you haven't cho chosen to submit yourself to the Lord um, in that way, to find refuge ultimately in him, uh, don't wait. It is so worth it. If you're here this morning and you have committed your life to Jesus, you have surrendered to his ways, but you, your life hasn't really shown that recently. You've been seeking pleasures and you've been seeking fulfillment and things other than him. Turn to him. Okay, that is not the way. It is a rejection of God's ways and the way he's intended for us to respond to him. Jesus makes it clear that the cost of discipleship is great. Jesus' standards are high in the sermon. Following him will cost us everything, as we will see in the coming weeks. But knowing Jesus is worth it. He makes that so clear. Would you respond with me in prayer to the Lord? Jesus, we come before you today, we're just reflecting on, on these statements um, that Jesus made, Lord, as he's enter presenting the, the sermon, God, and we're humbled, Lord, that the God um, who is the true blessing, the God who is experiencing true flourishing, chose to become uh, a curse, Lord, to enter into our world and become take on our shame, Lord, for the sake of us experiencing true human flourishing and blessing through him. God, that is not something that we deserve, Lord. We deserve condemn condemnation from you, Lord, and um, but Lord, you have shown mercy to us, and Lord, uh, pray that this isn't, as we leave today, Lord, this isn't just something that would, um, yeah, increase our knowledge, Lord, of your teaching, that this wouldn't just be something that would make us feel better or point us in the right direction, Lord, but it would transform our lives. Lord, I pray that we leave today finding refuge in the Son, in who you are, Lord, and rejoicing in the fact that, Lord, despite our sin, despite our, our poverty, impoverished states, Lord, before you, that you have chosen to bless us, God. Lord, we thank you for your kindness and ask that you would continue to transform our heart, Lord. Help us to see more of you as we continue our series in the Sermon on the Mount. That's in your name. Amen. Would you stand? Let's respond by singing a prayer to the Lord.
blessed are those who are spiritually bankrupt and they know it. All right, we're going to sing a prayer to the Lord. Be our vision, Lord.
Oh, Father, would those not just be pretty words, Lord, I pray that that would actually be our heart. Whatever befall, Lord, that we would count ourselves disciples of Jesus Christ, knowing that to give up our life is to gain it. Because in Christ, there is full satisfaction. He is joy. He is peace. In Him, there is refuge for the weary and weak-hearted and broken and abused. Lord, that's all of us. Lord, help us to find our satisfaction, our refuge in you, and to be satisfied. It's in Jesus' name. Church, uh, we are far over time. Uh, we tried to fit a ton of things into a short period of time. Um, but here's the deal. Uh, we, we have another song that we would love to sing with you. Uh, and I realize saying that, that some of you feel like so compelled to stay if there's music. If you have plans, uh, feel free. Like, don't worry if you need to leave. Uh, but if you have six minutes to spare, <laughs> six minutes, uh, we could use your help with some, with some clapping. Uh, let's sing to the Lord one last song.
a good song when the drummer is the biggest smile in the room, right? And we almost let him out of his cage. It's a, it's a miracle. He stayed in there. Church, it's so good to rejoice in those things with you. Let me just leave you with a word of scripture from Ephesians 3. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we can ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Church, may we leave from here flourishing knowing what it truly means to flourish, which is just to die to ourselves. That's so contrary to what the world says, but it's true. May we die to ourselves this week and live for Christ. It's good to worship with you. Have a great week in him.